with A and B singularities. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I think I speak on behalf of everyone uh, when I say that the talks have been great and the conference uh, had a very rich scientific and cultural program. And the <clears throat> Department of Mathematics was extremely hospitable, which was very conducive to the uh, collaborative atmosphere of this workshop. And so <clears throat> I would like, um, on behalf of the participants, I would like to acknowledge people who made this uh, workshop such a success, namely Yongnam Lee, David Hume, um, Jihoon Park, uh, the local organizers, and also Ian Morrison from the Fordham University. So please uh, thank them. I think truth in advertising, uh, I think probably Yongnam uh, would agree, uh, demands that uh, at least two of the organizers uh, admit that all the heavy lifting uh, was done by David and Jihoon, and that uh, really a second round of applause is due to them for a spectacular job. I mean, hospitality in Korea is always wonderful, and um, I knew from my experience as young now discussed that there was a high mark to meet, and I think they, they certainly succeeded wonderfully on everybody's behalf. Okay, so let me start with a baby example with, that we've already seen, uh, namely the stable reduction of the, uh, of the cusp. I'm going to take a smoothing of the cusp um, and by applying stable reduction. We all know that uh, the resulting stable limit that we see is a normalization of a curve with an attached elliptic tail. However, uh, so this example is in the book of um, Harrison Morrison, and the computation there shows that the G invariance that you get it, by applying stable reduction to this particular smoothing is, is zero, very special G invariant. And um, uh, whatever generic tangent direction in the deformation space of A2 you take, you always get the G invariant zero. Um, however, if you look at the smoothing given by equation of this form, such smoothings give all possible J invariants. And from this fact, you can deduce that uh, M11 bar has a representation as a quotient stack P46. Namely, it's a quotient stack of C2 by uh, minus the origin by the GM action where GM acts with weights 4 and 6. So hopefully this motivates the definition that I want to give of the varieties of stable limits of um, an arbitrary singularity, curve singularity. So I'm going to start with a C proper arithmetic genus G curve. Um, and I'm going to take a smoothable, assume that it has a smoothable singularity. And in this talk, I'll work only with uh, planar singularities, which are, of course, smoothable and moreover have um, non singular deformation spaces. So the definition. I want to make of this. I'm going to define the variety script T, um, which is going to be indexed by the um, complete local rank of the singularity, to be the variety of all possible stable limits. All stable limits of all smoothings of C. So, um, I should say that C has, should have, I'll assume that P is the uh, unique singularity of C. Okay, and so the points, the geometric points of this variety of stable limits is simply given our curves of this form. You have the normalization and you have the so-called to the tail of the stable reduction attached to the normalization of the curve. 
at B points. Here B is the number of branches at P. And um, let me call this tail by letter T. The arithmetic genus of the tail is uh, gamma, which is a delta invariant of the singularity minus number of branches plus one. So what it tells us is that um, the way I've defined the uh, variety of stable limits of the singularity is that, well, it sits inside mg bar. It's a closed can define it in such a way that it's a closed substack. But in fact, since the stable limits do not really depend on the normalization of C and depend only on the analytic, local analytic geometry of the singularity, uh, namely, all you record is uh, the moduli of T and the points of attachment, this variety of stable limits sits inside M gamma B inside MG bar. Uh, so let me give a couple of examples of this varieties of stable limits. For a cusp, we've seen that this is what you recover M11 bar. For the tack node, we recover um, two pointed genus one tails, which are also called bridges. Uh, for a D4 singularity, it's planar triple point we get triply pointed uh, elliptic curves. Now the varieties of stable limits inside MG bar are very special. They're often rational uh, since they're defined as a proper trans as the uh, proper transform of a point under rational map um, and they're certainly unirruled. Uni In particular, for example, HG bar inside MG bar is a variety of stable limits of um, a particular A to G plus one singularity where you have two P1s uh, meeting in a high order tack node. The Petri divisor inside, MG, in, inside M4 bar is a variety of stable limits of a particular Y cubed minus X to the six equals zero singularity. Um, now, uh, in this talk, I will focus on the case of A and D singularities. Um, well, yeah, so how do you see this? Well, by, I should say that many, this variety has been introduced uh, by Brandon Hassett, a variety of stable limits, and he computes the points for many, for, for many singularities in particular, or simple, simple singularities and also toric singularities. And um, um, the, to see that the Petri divisor is this variety, you observe that the tail sits on a weighted projective space P136. And you can see this by picking a deformation. Um, Well, in fact, you can see that it sits on P112. And of course, oh, oh, right. So genus, this is a quadric cone. And genus four curves on the quadric cone is precisely the curves on the Petri locus. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to record the points which lie in the variety of stable limits of A and D singularities. K plus one. The tails here, so I'm recording only tails, are curves of arithmetic genus K, which are hyperelliptic, and they marked by a divisor in G12. The A2K plus case is you have a techno, uh, you have a higher order cusp 
and the tail is again arithmetic genus K and the point, the marked point is a Weierstrass point. The case of D singularities, D two K plus one. I'm going to have x y square minus. The stable limits are. Genus K, um, where one marked point is Weierstrass point and the other point is free. And finally, D2K plus 2, the tails are three pointed. One point three, and the rest give you a G one two. So all tails of, of stable limits of A and D singularities are hyperelliptic. So, in other words, if we compactify, so I've described you the generic stable limits. If you take the closure inside M G bar, we recover spaces which are essentially uh, spaces of admissible covers of Harris and Mum of Harris and Mumford um, of degree two. So let me summarize. So we have admissible covers degree two and genus. N over 2 for An and N minus 1 over 2 for Dn um, marked by a divisor in G12 and a point in the case of Dn. Right. So now I would like to describe another way to get a hold of this variety Tan and Tdn. Uh, by exploiting the GM action on the versal deformation of the singularity. So let me let me recall that um, I will treat the, the case of AN um, since it's slightly simpler. I'm going to look at the versal deformation of AN singularity. This is simply can be taken to be affine with coordinates a naught through a n minus 1. And the inverse of family over it is given by a very simple formula. And of course, we have jam action uh, both on the versal deformation, but also on the universal family and weights are so um, clearly we want uh, the weights to be 10 plus 2 through 4, n plus 1, n 2. Here the case of n even, and here's the case of n odd. Uh, so the difference, uh, dependence on, on parity is due to the fact that you can well, clearly, if you have an action uh, with weights n plus 1 and 2 on y and x respectively, if n is odd, then you can take the action with weights uh, n plus 1 over half and 1 on y and x respectively. And the, there is a general theory due to Pinkham, which says that, uh, which describes what essentially is a, um, Quotient stack. The deformations of a n singularities minus the origin via this GM action. Uh, well, and 
to see what this quotient stack is, I want to know that the stable reduction of a family defined by an orbit of the GM action, namely the family um, given by an orbit of generic a not through a n minus 1 is the following, is simply the curve with this equation. And this curve sits on the weighted projective space P2. So the x has weight one, 2, y has weight n plus 1, and z has weight 1. And this is clearly hyperelliptic and also the singularities of these curves are given by the singularities of, an, of any fiber uh, of the universal family over any point inside the orbit and so the singularities are at worst a n minus 1 the singularities to which a n can deform so we can, we can identify this quotient stack with hyperelliptic curves with at worst <coughs> n minus one singularities. Now the, this, this quotient stack and the variety of stable limits of an, of course they are rational, they're the same on the dense open and the only difference is um, along certain locus, namely the locus of, of curves with at least A2 singularities inside this, inside this quotient stack. And I would like to give, to describe the relation between TAN and the quotient stack. So to do that, um, I need, so I would like to describe the quotient stack as the as a blowdown of the variety of stable limits of a n singularity, or in other words, I want to exhibit um, a concrete bar a concrete blow blow ups of this stack, which after applying which I get the variety of stable limits of the a n singularity. So, in fact, I will do this for a d n singularity, and to do that. I want to explain how to treat the D singularities on the same footing as with A singularities. So I will So I'm going to discuss the deformations of DN singularities. And I'll have a proposition. So I will state it slightly informally. Hopefully uh, it will be clear, for example, from the proof. Uh, how to formalize it and how to make the statement even stronger. So deformations of the end singularities are equivalent to deformations. of a um, n minus 1 singularity with a section. Right. Okay. So the proof is constructive. Um, I'm just going to give you an equivalence. Um, and for this I need to look at the 
deformation space of universal deformation of a n minus one singularity with a section. And if so, if f is is a normal form of the singularity, this is simply as a vector space. So the underlying space as a vector space of the universal deformation is simply the this vector space. It's a standard deformation theory. And so uh, I'm going to give this the space coordinates. It's n dimensional, n minus 1 for deformations of a n minus 1 and 1 dimension for sections. And the coordinates are this. The universal family has equation is this equation x equals 0 and we have a universal section sigma which is given by 0 0 um, so this is the deformations universal deformation space of n minus 1 singularity with a section uh, to go to dn singularity I'm going to observe that um, I can take, well, there is another section, the conjugate section on the universal family, and I'm going to blow it, blow it up. Right, so I'm taking the conjugate section, sigma prime, which is given by xy equals 0b. It's uh, a vial but not Cartier. And I consider uh, consider the blow up of the section over T. And I write down the local equation local equation um, of the blown up family over T is this. Um, Yes, um, right. Uh, so I apologize for missing a term in my universal family. <coughs> Equals zero. And this is precisely universal deformation of a DN singularity right so what this blow up does uh, it takes a universal family for a and minus one singularity with a section and replaces it by a universal family for a DN singularity and on the fibers it's very simple. So on fibers, I'm replacing A1 with a section by, um, well, essentially by a curve with two nodes. Um, if my section sigma lands on A2, I replace in the fiber of the blow up, um, I see a D3 singularity.
and this one I'll call D2. Okay, um, if I have, if my section lands on the tech node, this is getting replaced by um, D4 singularity, where one of the branches is P1, D4, and so on. So, for example, if I have uh, A4, it's replaced by 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 D5. Okay. So this is my proposition, and so from now on, I will think of Dn singularities simply as a n minus one singularities with a section. So, with with this insight, I would like to make a definition. So before, so before I make a definition, um, I'm going to fix some numbers. So number n is going to be fixed, uh, and it's going to be an integer. You should you should think of this as a index of a singularity, and parameters alpha and beta will vary. Uh, and satisfy the condition that they add up at most to one. And now, for any such two parameters, alpha and beta, which I call weights, uh, there exist unique integers, k and l, such that the following two inequalities are satisfied. I will explain what these inequalities mean after I make a definition. Um, okay, so the definition. And this will be the DN case, uh, which I want to treat the AN case being simpler <coughs> and essentially is a part of the DN case. Okay, so we pointed why is it admissible hyperliptic covers with A, K, and D L singularities. And um, the objects in this, um, well, it's going to be a stack, uh, which I denote by, I have two notations for the stack. One notation specifies the singularities uh, of the objects, and this notation uh, specifies some stability conditions that uh, I will use in the definition. So this stack is going to parameterize points, parameterize the following objects. Uh, the Objects will be degree two maps between pointed nodal curves. So I have a map from a three pointed curve C to a curve marked by a divisor and a point. So this is two to one, and uh, R is a tree of P1s. In other words, the target of the morphism is going to be simply a semi-stable rational curve. The divisor D is going to be a divisor in the smooth locus 
of the rational curve of degree n. n is a parameter, as a, n is a number that I fixed at the very beginning. And uh, the morphism, as I've said, of, is of degree 2. And the branch divisor of the morphism is given precisely by, by d. And now f is going to be et al. elsewhere, uh, which of course uh, raises, gives us a small complication in that if divisor d has a odd degree on one of the rational components, I cannot have a map of schemes which has its properties. And so I have to allow the simplest stack structure, the mildest stack structure, which allows me to make the definition. And namely, I want to allow um, at some nodes of my curves C and R, I want to allow um, some twisting. So this idea comes from the um, paper of Abramovich, Kort, and Vistoli on twisted covers. And the idea is to simply, over the node, over the odd nodes, a node that separates the curve into two components on which the divisor D has, has odd degree, uh, I want to make the node to have an arbifold structure and over over the odd node, I'm going to require my f to be at all. And this is easily achieved by just by taking an at all cover of this, uh, of this stack. Um, so this is at all if I choose u to be invertible. Right, and of course, um, if you go to the course moduli space, then what you see, you see precisely the compatibility. That you see the that both of the points, both of the branches of C at the odd node are ramified, and well, well since we're in degree two, of course, the ramifications match, um, and you recover an admissible cover when you go to the course moduli space. So this is mild. Uh, technical condition, which I won't discuss any longer, and I'll just treat all my things, all my objects as as usual curves. Okay. So one additional, well, I'll mention that later, uh, an additional advantage of working with orbit curves. So. Um, right. Unfortunately, I'm not done with the definition. There are two more stability conditions. I want to kill the automorphisms, and the stability conditions are um, my usual ones, and they are basically on the target curve. So for any x in the target curve, the multiplicity of the weighted, devi of the weighted divisor, um, alpha d plus beta fq plus p is at most 1. So in other words, I weight divisor D, the branch divisor, by alpha, and I weight the image of point Q, but by beta. And the point P is always um, has weight 1. So I should probably say that P records the, uh, the fact that P1 and P2 are conjugate. And that's exactly what we saw when we looked at the stable limits at the lim limits, at the tails of stable reductions of D singularities and also A singularities. And the second stability condition is the usual one. Um, omega twisted by the weighted divisor example. Great. Right, so, um, so we should Q corresponds to a section. I, sh I think of it as a section of my curve. And that's 
that's a section that we saw in the stable reduction of desingularities. And P1 and P2 are the two conjugate points, or I don't rule out the possibilities that P1 and P2 agree. Right, so, oh, okay. That's the definition. So you just erase the, the beta F and Q term to get the AN basically. Just... Yes, essentially, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's one possibility. Uh, I suppose you can just take, right, I mean, that's, that would be the AN. You, you just forget the marking. You, you make the same definition without the Q. Um, Okay. Right, so that's the definition and what is the result? Well, <coughs> the way definition is set up, it's, um, it's pretty clear that the objects in this uh, category are going to be, have smooth deformation spaces. The morphism, this morphism F by definition is relatively you know, local complete intersection, very nice morphism, it's locally free, and the target has no, it has smooth deformation space, so the result is not very surprising. The first part, <coughs> at least. So here I'm working, let me say that I'm working in either characteristic zero or a very large characteristic. Uh, and if, the, if, the, if that is, if I impose that restriction on characteristic, I see that my HN KL is a um, smooth proper, and it's DM stack. Right, so after I state the result, I should go back and explain what those really are, um, if it's not already clear. Uh, is, it, is a smooth proper DM stack. And let me just say parameterizing covers with at worst AK and DL singularities. Right, and so what's, what's the reason? What is the, where do I get singularities from? I get them from the stability condition. From the inequalities star that I've erased, I allow up to k plus one points of the branch divisor to collide. So k plus one points, points of D. This is a divisor. <laughs> Can collide, and this gives me uh, a k singularity on C, on the cover, and I also allow L points of D and FQ can collide. And by, by the proposition, given the equivalence between a L minus one singularities with a section, I, I, can, I can think of my cover as having a DL singularity. Right, I can blow up the total family uh, of covers and I get a DL singularity. And in particular, since I have only one point Q which varies freely, I can have at most one, so at most C can have at most one D singularity. Uh, which could be disappointing. Uh, on the other hand, the stacks really describe closely the globalized deformations of D singularities and deformations of any D singularity has only, any small deformation can have only one D singularity in the fiber. Um, so that's, uh, that's the reason we see only one D singularity. Um, this, this is a part one of the main theorem existence. Uh, part two, gives me some hold on the geometry of this, of the stacks. Well, <coughs> if I forget the stack structure, uh, of what I recover is essentially a rational curve and a branch divisor, because a degree two cover is determined by those two um, 
by, by, the, by, the, by the target and the branch divisor. And uh, what it says is that the coarse moduli space of my, of my stacks are always simply moduli of rational curves with some weighted divisor, marked by a weighted divisor. So they are essentially Hassett spaces of weighted rational curves marked by a symmetric group action. Uh, so these are the coarse moduli spaces. However, I'm really interested in the modular interpretation. And to get that, I need to allow some stack structure. Well, to be even more precise, in the case when, when n when n is even, the coarse moduli space of HNKL is a 2 to 1 cover of the, of the quotient of the Hassett space. So it's not, not always Hassett space. It can be 2 to 1 cover. And uh, so I'm now ready to state the second part of the result. And I have natural. So for given n, I can construct stacks H and KL whenever, uh, well, the definition makes sense. And you can work out that this makes sense for uh, L minus 1 at most k. Namely, if we allow DL singularity, we better allow um, AL minus 1 singularity. So, and, but there is no further restrictions on what kind of spaces I can get. And the spaces for various K and L fit into a very nice sequence of divisoral contractions. So there exists a sequence of divisoral natural transformations or between these functors so exist divisorial contractions where uh, I start with HN11. I allow only A1 singularities. And I can allow worse and worse singularities in a, in a controllable fashion. And uh, at the very end, I can allow up to a n minus 1 and d n minus 1. Here I allow all n minus one, all up to a n minus one, but don't allow any d singularities. And um, so I get this uh, lattice of moduli spaces. Now, H n one two is familiar, right? We allow a ones and d twos, which I think of simply occurs with with nodes again. So this is in fact the variety of stable limits of a DN singularity, uh, or the harris Mumford admissible covers, um, up to, well. <coughs> and the very last space we've already seen, too, um, I proved that this is, in fact, the quotient stack. Or we question the deformations of dn minus the origin by a natural gm action. So it's the, so the course here is simply a weighted projective space p n over 2, 1, 2, n minus 1. So that's very simple space, Picard number 1. And uh, Well, what are the morphisms if I go from H, HKL to HNK plus 1L? What I do here, I replace genus K over 2 unpointed tails or bridges
by AK plus one singularity. So we've seen the, the stable reduction of AK plus one singularity is the genus K plus one over two, bridge over tail, depending on parity of K. And when I go from this space to this space, I get rid of those, they become unstable here and getting replaced by AK plus one singularity. And this morphism replaces genus L over two on um, now pointed. So bridges or tails with a point Q on them, pointed tails or bridges by um, DL singularity. Now the local structure of this morphism is, is also clear. Um, uh, to describe it, I need to, well, I need to mention something. Uh, so the third part is really a corollary of the construction or as a definition if C has has AK1 through AKR and possibly DL singularity or let's call DM then the deformations of my cover subject smoothly into the product of deformation spaces of AK1 of the singularities I call them interior singularities So this is smooth. And um, of course you can't expect the same statement to hold for arbitrary singularities of C because the nodes of an admissible cover which lie over a node of the target cannot be deformed independently, right? So that's the best you can hope for. Uh, other than that, the deformations are, uh, you can get all possible deformations. So three also says that the moduli stacks H and KL are not open subsets of, um, say, the stack of all curves. And uh, finally, part number four of the main result also describes each of the module, each of the spaces H and KL as a log canonical model, say, of this space. Uh, so to be more precise, uh, this is coarse. Course moduli space, and let me now use my first notation H and sub alpha beta uh, is proj of the section ring of the log canonical divisor on the variety of stable limits of a dense singularity of this form delta irreducible plus. plus delta reducible. Uh, so let me step aside and just remark that TDN is a stack of nodal curves and delta reducible and delta reducible is the usual divisor classes and delta sub W is a divisor, is a via charge divisor, it's a divisor of curves where point Q is the, is the ramification point of the, of the map. Um, so all these divisoral contractions have an interpretation as, well, in fact, as on the level of course moduli spaces as extremal, um, in some sense, look as, as yeah, as contractions coming from Mori theory, and uh, well, that's the end of the story for the main theorem, and in the remaining ten minutes I can discuss the applications. Uh, so I will not say anything about the proof. Uh, as I've observed, the part number one essentially follows some definitions. You check some, uh, you check your objects that are unobstructed. Number two follows again from definitions. You need to real, you simply define the natural transformations between functors and they, they, they parallel the natural transformations between weighted rational curves of Hassett. And uh, 
Part number three is definition. Part number four, um, you have to write down an ample divisor in the course moduli space. And um, well, we know how to do this in general. Um, again, course moduli space is essentially a two-to-one cover of Hassett space, and we can write down ample divisors in Hassett spaces. So this gives us the last part of the theorem. Um, With some work you can all, we can also show that um, well that the you can get a hold on the local structure of this rational morphisms. They are essential on the level deformation spaces of singularities. They are weighted blow ups defined by the GM action. Oh. Okay. And now applications. So um, first application will be related to uh, the talk given by Sebastian Casalano, uh, Jano Casalano Martin, uh, and it it explains how to do how to resolve the moduli map uh, in some very special case. I will discuss only case of A and D singularities. So let me just observe that there exists a unique point X. In the stack of, um, so this is deformations of dm plus one minus origin mod gm, where x has uh, dn singularity. Right, so we have exactly one orbit of deformations of dn plus one singularity, which have dn singularities. And so locally, at all locally, a neighborhood of X is precisely, using part three of the main theorem, is deformations of D and singularity. And now, I will consider a situation in which, um, so suppose for simplicity I'm going to take a curve C, uh, suppose the curve has dn singularity and the curve doesn't have to be a cover, just take any proper curve with dn singularity and to resolve a rational map from the deformations of C to, well, I can take mg bar, and if I if I ask for resolution of this map, I essentially ask for simultaneous semi-stable reduction over the deformation space of a dn singularity, and this is what's been done by Casalana, Martin, and Laza. Uh, but also I can ask for uh, a rational map to the stack, which is only conjecture to exist, um, of course with AK and DL singularities. And so EG, as we've seen from um, Jared's talk, MG 5 nines is a candidate. Um, so to resolve this rational map, it suffices to work on the virtual deformation space of a dn singularity because this morphism is smooth. And to resolve the map, I'm going to just take, uh, I'm going to consider the blow up. Hn plus 1 KO, Hn plus 1 NN in a neighborhood of this point X, 
that I've just that I've discussed. So this is what the blow up does in the neighborhood of X. It blows up the virtual deformation of a DN singularity, precisely the tall neighborhood of X in this stack. And um, it tells you how to modify the curve, the, the family uh, over the blow up to obtain a family of curves with only K and AK and DL singularities. And um, that would give, that blow up gives you a resolution of the Moduli map to one of the stacks. Uh, so I will not go into further detail. Well, okay, I have three more minutes, and in the remaining three minutes, um, I'm just gonna make an observation which does not really depend on the um, on the whole construction given in this talk. Uh, but which can be easily deduced from it. Namely, the variety of stable limits of a DN singularity, if I think if I put it inside MG bar by taking a proper curve of genus G with a DN singularity, as we've seen, it's it's rational to a weighted projective space of Picard number one. And, well, every weighted projective space has uh, essentially only one line bundle. Uh, and uh, in other words, the, there is essentially a canonical covering family of the variety of stable limits of a DN singularity. And so there is a well-defined slope uh, of a divisor, so there exists essentially unique, can so canonical, let me just say covering family of TDN. And when I compute the slope of this canonical family, and that I can do on this weighted projective space because a generic point here avoids the A2 and D3 loci, uh, I get a slope of the curve inside MG bar. And after the computation is done, uh, all the slopes are as follows for D to H plus one and three H plus seven over H eight H plus ten for D to H plus two. So for example seven tenths for D three and five nines for D four. And, well, even though it doesn't tell us anything precise, at least we know that if, our, if a divisor has slope um, equal to one of these thresholds, then the locus TDN inside MG bar has to be flipped. Well, it has to be contracted at that slope, uh, most likely. But at the very least, it has to be flipped. So. Uh, that's where I want to stop. Thank you very much.